Hi, I'm Amanda Dubberly, Assistant Curator and Academic Liaison at UConn's William Benton Museum of Art. I am thrilled to introduce Douglas Deggs, whose work is featured in the 2020 UConn Studio Art and Digital Media and Design faculty exhibition here at the Benton Museum. Douglas is Assistant Professor of Art in Painting and Drawing at the University of Connecticut. He received his MFA from the University of Iowa and his BA from Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. His work has recently been exhibited at the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, Nightlight Gallery in Chicago, Vanderbilt University and Lipscomb University in Nashville, Versa in Chattanooga, Atlanta Contemporary in Atlanta, Yellow Door Gallery in Des Moines, and Eli Center of Contemporary Art in New Haven. His work has been supported by several artist residencies, including the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation, the Vermont Studio Center, and the Malay Colony. Following Douglas's talk, there will be a Q&A with Kelsey Scordall, a second year MFA student in studio art at UConn. So thanks so much to Douglas and Kelsey. Hey everyone. My name is Douglas Steggs and I am faculty in the Department of Art and Art History and I'm here to tell you all a little bit about my work. Before I get going with that, I want to say thank you to Amanda Dubberly for the invitation to share my work. She's the Assistant Curator at the William Benton Museum of Art. I also want to say thank you to the museum and the museum staff. I really appreciate the opportunity to share my work uh, with the campus community, so thank you. So before I get moving with the more formal part of my artist talk, and the Q&A with Kelsey Scordall that's going to follow, I wanted to show you all my studio. So I just walked in and you'll see there's this large wall of windows, get some really good natural light on my two painting walls. Here's the one where I do most of my painting. And this is the section of that wall where I spend most of my time. So these works are in progress, as are these. And really everything I'm going to show you all are in progress. Got a bunch of surfaces that are barely started there. My table with a palette on it and a pile of collage materials. So this wall over here, it's got a bunch of unfinished work as well and various stages of completion. Got this, uh, this chair with a little work surface attached to it that I sit at and think about the paintings and make drawings. So just for a sense of scale, that small painting in the far right hand corner is about 8 inches tall by 10 inches wide, and then the, the works on paper on that wall are about that size or smaller, and the four works that are vertical are all paintings on panel and they're about 2 feet tall by a foot and a half wide. Okay, this is my studio. So both of these paintings are from Props for Pictures. It's a project that I've been working on now for just over a decade. And it started with uh, just, just kind of a general musing on, you know, what paintings are and what images are and noting that paintings seemed like objects for the body and images for the eyes and mind. And it, and it later became um, a kind of list of seemingly unanswerable questions like, what are images made of? Are they material? Are they immaterial? Are they both somehow? And, and now the questions have started to include, um, you know, things that reflect this moment we're, we're living in. The, the pandemic, COVID-19, has us um, maybe thinking and seeing in virtual space more often. So how does an image live off screen and offline? How does an image live on screen and online? And I think in many ways, this is how all of my projects happen. They start with open-ended, unanswerable questions and move through uh, answers to those questions in the form of uh, a painting. So these paintings all begin the same way. They begin with a thick and textured layer of plaster-like material that then I seal and paint. And the, the painting that happens on top of this texture surface really only incidentally acknowledges the surface below. I think this 
makes the paintings hold on to an aesthetics of awkwardness, which I really um, find appealing in the work. I think it opens up the work to, to being read. Uh, there's, there's less magic in terms of how the thing comes to be, and I'll speak to that in a moment. But uh, in many ways, I, I think about these paintings like working with a found object or found surface. The surface has a rich history that it comes with, or at least in this case, the suggestion of it. Um, and, then, and then the challenge for me in making the work is to get an image on top of that surface. So I'm, I'm interested in how the imagery has to be grafted onto the surface, as if the painting surface, the painting support, is designed to, to reject the painting that happens on top of it. So the way I like to think about this is that the painted image, the skin, is at odds with the bones of the painting. And uh, another way to say this is that the painting is, or the painted image is at odds with history of its own making. And, and I, my hope is that this engages with painting's long-standing interest in fiction, fictional space, illusionistic space, by the surface being fabricated to suggest a history that isn't actually true. Now on to another project. I'm going to move pretty quickly through a range of them just to give you a, a sense of all the things that I'm up to here. So this painting project called Making Stuff Like Pictures is in some respects similar to the previous one. It has the same kind of support. I'm making a panel and then in this case using a really large taping knife to trowel on that same plaster-like material that then I, I sand smooth and patch and make a fairly uniform and smooth surface that then I prime and I paint on top of. So, so it's kind of similar in construction and material as the previous work. So, so these paintings are often about thinking about object and image tensions that uh, seem to be the bread and butter of painting, if you will. So these paintings are all really low relief carvings. I'm using different kinds of knives and also uh, rotary tools. I'm using a Dremel often to carve the surface. And they, they, they basically look like a woodcut that's been painted over a bunch. So here are two more works from that same project, Making Stuff Like Pictures. These are both carved reproductions of surfaces from public spaces. Mostly these public spaces are in New York City and from subway platforms. So here I'm interested in the ways in which abstraction can render specific and even autobiographical content anonymous and illegible. And, and when I use the word abstraction, I mean the process by which we take something from life, from lived experience, and bring it into art. So many of us, I'm sure, have had that, the experience of hoping, wanting to place something of significance in a work of art that viewers will take note of or respond to, and for whatever reason, it just doesn't happen. Our best intentions miss the mark somehow. For me, these works are about embodying this problem and letting specific concerns, images, associations disappear into what looks like non-objective painting. Another thing I, I, I'm really invested in in this work is thinking about the object image quality of paintings and trying to have these works live a dual life. Have them both depict something, but also be the thing that's being depicted. So because they're low relief carvings or sculptures, basically, they from a distance read like images and then up close are sculptural enough to, to carry the same feel and qualities that the surfaces in the public spaces that I initially encountered. Um, would be like. So another project I'd like to share with you all is called Square Paintings After Joseph and Annie. Now, I don't specify who Joseph and Annie are in the title of the project, but the project title refers to Joseph and Annie Albers. I spent a short period of time as an artist in residence at the Albers Foundation roughly two years ago, and that's where I started making these paintings. And all of them look to small moments for subject matter, like the twisting of a leg or the bending of a knee. And for those of you that have visited the foundation, you know that it's in a rural area and the foundation sits on a mostly wooded property. So there are some trails through the woods and in walking through the woods while I was there in residence, I had this experience where the woods overtook everything. 
you would you would find something of visual interest on a walk and your eyes would focus on it and then defocus pretty soon thereafter um, just because of the sheer visual interference that the you know that the trees offered up so in some respects these paintings in um, much more simple means try to try to hold on to that visual phenomenon that that focusing and defocusing finding and losing that that I found to be so compelling in the woods at the Albers Foundation so I, Thomas Naskowski is one of my favorite painters he uh, was a mentor of mine. I worked as his artist assistant for a year shortly after graduate school. And I always appreciated his relationship to drawing as a painter. He would, during the life of the painting, explore different trajectories the painting might have taken or even could take in, in a bunch of small drawings. So I held on to that and in this project came upon a process that's a little bit related, um, which I'll tell you about in the next slide. So all of this work really looks to my drawing practice, not just for source material, but also for subject matter. In many ways, these paintings aspire to be drawings. They want to be drawings. The paint on the surface of these paintings is just like the paint on the surface of the tiny drawings that I've made, you know, in advance of the paintings. So there's similar opacity, there's similar body, there's the same approach to composition and cropping happening, the colors are, are the same, and the paint's already mixed, and often that's simply because it's coming straight out of the tube, and as is the case here and the work in the previous slide. So both of these paintings are from my Rubber Tree Paintings series or, or project. And I'll say more on the paintings in just, in just a moment, but first I wanted to say a few things about my studio practice more generally. It seems to me that a lot of artists negotiate institutional and commercial pressure to work with stylistic cohesion or, or some degree of visual cohesion across their, their studio practice, across their work. And it seems that, that um, the goal is ultimately to arrive at mature work that is recognizably one's own and that is maybe appropriately idiosyncratic. So my studio practice um, is about turning away from that impulse and pressure and trying to look for opportunities to juggle as many varied things as possible. So I've made a point in my studio practice to work toward more incongruence, more dissonance in the work or across the work, if you will. So, so in, in many ways, the body of work, if, if we can call it that, has been about range of, of forms and materials and processes and the imagery I'm working with as well. And um, my, my hope is that I'm, I'm engaging with style, but not as a thing to aspire to, to have, to embody, but, but to treat it as a conceptual space. So with this, with, with this project, the Rubber Tree Paintings project, I'm heading off in a new direction and I'm modeling my painting practice in, in multiple ways after Sylvia Plymouth Mangold and Claude Villa. Both artists have spent decades painting the same subject matter. In the case of Claude Villa, he's painting the same, he calls it the form, he's painting the same decorative pattern, the same image, over and over again. So a painting of his from you know, yesterday looks the same as a painting that he made in the 1970s. And in a similar fashion, Sylvia Plymouth Mangold has been painting the same, not, not, not the same image, but the same subject matter over and over again in four decades. She has a studio in upstate New York, and from some of her studio windows, she can see a number of different trees, and those trees have been the subject matter of her paintings for decades. So about two years ago, I purchased a rubber tree house plant, and I have uh, set out to slowly make drawings and paintings of this rubber tree plant for as long um, as I can endure and for as long as I can, and honestly, <laughs> for as long as I can keep the plant alive. Uh, and, and, and what I'm interested in here is thinking about um, that rubber tree plant maybe in a similar way to Sylvia Plymouth Mangold is looking to those trees out of her studio window. For, for inspiration, for subject matter, for a way to structure compositions and, you know, get, get imagery in, into, the, into the painting. 
The hope here is that the repeated and devotional use of a single subject, this rubber tree plant, will offer up something interesting in regard to the ways in which a chosen subject and meaning commingle in painting. And, and of course, what a painting is of is not the same thing as the painting's meaning. My, my hope is that what the painting is of, this mashup of a solitary rubber tree plant and a decorative ground, can be unseen or ignored, and that meaning sits somewhere beyond the image. And in this gesture, this commitment to subject matter being sustained over a long period of time. And because this work is what's included in the faculty exhibition, I thought I would share just a little bit more about what I'm up to, um, in terms of process at least. So here we see in we see a drawing of the rubber tree plant on the left, just a quick, super quick study with a marker, and then a little bit slower, almost meditative painting on paper. And this is where I'm finding the ground onto which I, I place the, the almost collaged feeling rubber tree plant. So two more, another pairing of one of these abstract works on paper that's made paint and ink on um, unprimed paper, and then the another study of the rubber tree plant, this one a little bit slower. So I, I thought maybe I'd backtrack for a moment and just say that with this work and with looking at Claude Violat's work and Sylvia Plymouth Mangold's work, the question that, that I am most excited about asking is just simply like, why would anybody paint the same thing 10 times? I don't know, maybe five times, but these artists and hopefully myself too are, are are making drawings and paintings of the same subject matter 100 200 300 times over like why do that and what does it mean i thought i would end this short artist talk by showing you some work that's happening right now so the the drawing and the painting on the on the left have been made within the past few months and are are indicative of of what I've been working on in the studio most recently and it's part of a new project that I am tentatively calling a squirrel from memory and that's a nod to to my family and my upbringing uh, which was in in the woods um, often in North Louisiana. So the drawing on the left is a uh, is a drawing of a digital collage that I made um, using printed ephemera and cell phone photographs from, from my mom and from myself. And the painting on the right is similar without the collage element. It's actually the same character, the man that appears in the drawing on the left. Um, that's the back of his head in the painting on the right. So, I, you know, I'm not really sure where this is headed. I, I have, have some sense of it, but again, I think that um, Part of what's exciting about being an artist is not not knowing what's to come and and knowing that that meaning making doesn't happen instantaneously. At least meaning making maybe that um, feels uh, formative and and you know is going to stick around and and have long lasting impact. So thank you all for your time. I really I really appreciate your interest in my work and also for your um, endurance here. I know I ran through really quickly a bunch of, of possibly disparate things here. All right, um, okay. So in your project, Making Stuff Like Pictures, I noticed that there was a lot of language and a lot of words used like relief and carve and it became clear that the paintings almost felt like sculpture but through the lens of painting and so i'm curious if you would ever reverse that process and make paintings but through the lens of sculpture if that makes sense totally makes sense um so so i have thought about it and i and i don't know a way into it yet for myself but i think about katherine bradford's shelf paintings as as that kind of offering, right? Like uh, arriving at a painting through sculptural means. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with that work, but um, I'm particularly. so it's, so it's a shelf more or less adhered to a painting and then on the wall and then on that shelf are sculptural objects. So it becomes almost like a miniature stage setting, almost diorama like, and then there are figures on the shelf. Um, or I guess Jessica Stockholder maybe is somebody who's like th thinking about painting in three dimensions. Um, 
but yeah, so that, so that project, the making stuff like pictures project is really about having, like thinking about the way objects behave at a distance. So it's totally, as you said, a sculptural object. It's a carved thing that it, when you back off of it, it flattens and becomes the painting. So um, yeah, I'm trying to think what, what maybe an inversion of that would be would be maybe something that became more dimensional as you backed away from it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's some, some version of that's in the cards, but I don't know what that is yet. Yeah, fair. Um, I noticed also that in a lot of the later project too, that there's a lot of patterns in the work and repetitive mark making. And I'm curious about the role that patterns or that kind of act of making those marks might have in creating or flattening space for you in your work? Yeah, so that's, that's um, I think, something I've held on to from my, my education. I think in, in early studio art classes in college, I worked with an abstract painter who um, just in, in, introduced me to just basic figure ground relationships that were all contingent on having a really active, engaging field and sort of privileging that in the same way or to the same extent that you, that you might, the subject or the figure. So attentiveness to, to environment, I suppose, um, sort of a, um, an eye this, this, this um, professor instilled in me. Um, but I think more than that, it's just a formal device to, to I, 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 what I've learned about myself in the past few years is that I'm really interested in aesthetics that have a little bit of an edge that sort of feel familiar or palatable, but barely so. So there's, there's um, for me, there's kind of an interest in, in, in aesthetics that feels awkward. And, and I, I mentioned that in, in the talk in passing, but anyway, in regards to the field, I've been making these works on paper that are really tiny that use like a tessellation effect to make a grid or kind of woven ground that then I set flat shapes on that have a kind of halo, a second flat shape below them. So there's something about the suggestion of space opening up, but everything exists, you know, as uh, planar information. I think that um, that is a way to make a thing is interesting to me because it, it um, like engages a certain kind of expectation of pictorial space that is only halfway indulged. And then just not really like a fully formed question, but just curious about color and how palettes might be arrived at and like whether that process is more intuitive or predetermined or what goes into that? Um, so I, I was watching an interview actually between, um, between one of the um, University of Connecticut MFA grads, Ashante Kendall and um, her college professor, Paul Collins. And um, at some point color came up in that conversation. And uh, Paul said something about every time, every time the words color theory um, are, are mentioned, uh, an angel dies. Um, and, and I thought, <laughs> I, I um, that, that resonated um, with me because I think that my relationship with color it's not arbitrary, but it's more incidental to other considerations. I think one of the main things that I'm thinking about when I'm making a painting, which I often think about as, as a, a kind of building process, um, paint comes with particular um, attributes, material, physical attributes. So I'm paying attention to the body of the paint, physicality of the paint, the sheen of it, the saturation level of it, the opacity, the transparency. And I'm thinking about that in regards to color groupings and also a desire for uh, varying levels of contrast, usually super low contrast or super high contrast tends to be where my paintings land. Um, and so the color is there just as a way to meet the needs of all those considerations really, I guess. Um, so color is almost like a means to an end. Yeah, and I think I think in line with what I said earlier about having some interest um, in, 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 I guess it's not just the awkward, it's maybe the unexpected, 
um, or brushing up against things that feel borderline distasteful aesthetically. Like right, right now I find myself wanting to use a lot of red and green and I share that work with people. And of course, you know, the Christmas is inescapable, but there's something about the like ha having to carry that and figure out how to drop it off or leave it behind is really, is it an interesting problem to solve? So for the rubber tree paintings, I'm reminded a bit of like art history with things like Monet painting the, I think it's pronounced Rouen Cathedral as a study of the light over and over again, repeatedly. And these paintings feel like they're repeated as a study for meeting and trying to see how that shifts on a daily basis. So I'm just, I'm curious about how your relationship to everyday objects maybe has started to shift as you study one object with intensity. Um, yeah, this project, that project in particular has been a vehicle for really all, not becoming an altogether new or different painter, but growing in some surprising ways. I think outside of teaching uh, a relationship to um, direct or observational drawing and painting is um, not something I'm actively in pursuit of, you know, that my concerns in, in painting or elsewhere. And this project has kind of reintroduced that, you know, looking outside of the world of images and maybe more locally into things that are in my space and obviously three dimensional. Um, so that, that sort of shift of where I'm looking for, um, you know, for, for a lot of things, I guess in this, in this case, in that project subject matter, right. Um, so, so that, that, that sort of shift in where I'm looking is kind of new and a product of that project, but you're asking more generally, like, how am I, how is it changing other things? Um, I think what well, one I've moved so much, it seems like on average, I'm moving every 10, 12 months um, until more recently. And so the, the things in my space um, sort of are these um, markers of place or embodiments of home that get, that get to travel with me. And so they certainly like this project has made me, you know, look at other things in my space and wonder, okay, well, for my project's sake, does it need to be this particular plant? Like, why can't it be something else? Um, but uh, most of that ends at just me considering other other plants to, to swap it out with. There's something about the risk of the plant not making it that um, charges the project with something else. Like I've got to, I've got to have a relationship with this thing and, and, and take care of it for me to be able to keep making paintings of it. So I, I think it wouldn't quite make sense for me to, I'm looking across the room and seeing I've got a broom leaning against a wooden chair and thinking, you know, like they, those objects wouldn't do that kind of thing for me. No, uh, there's less at stake almost. Yeah. But, but I mean, I find myself asking that question. So, so certainly the project, yeah, the project's changed me in a lot of ways. Frankly, it's also changed me in terms of how I, I teach the project itself. Um, uh, has me making slower paintings too. Um, anyway, getting away from your question a little bit there. I'm curious, this is not really relevant, but is that the plant behind you on the windowsill? Uh, this is the plant nice. and I haven't finished a painting of it since very early 2019, but I'm still making drawings of it. So I'm, I'm, yeah, that's the plan. Do you plan to have the project last? Like, I know you said the life of the plant, but like, let's say the plant ends up living for like 40 years. Would you continuously keep this going? Do you think? That's such a good question. Um, I mean, I, I like to think so. It's hard to know, you know, I, I, um, I was taught that, you know, you, you, you never say never, like that, that kind of thing. Um, and also I work across so many projects and that is ref reflective of me needing to or wanting to having a split attention across a lot of different concerns. And so I can anticipate my interest in the project waning, I guess is the honest answer. Um, but yeah, no, my hope is that frankly, that I don't know what the lifespan is at one point I did when I bought the plant back in, in mid 2018. So it's only been ongoing for whatever that is just over two years. Um, I've forgotten how long rubber tree plants live for, but, 
let's say they live 40 years. Yeah, I would like to, I would, I'd like to see the, see the project through. Yeah, it's interesting like what something like that, how it would change as you change most. I, I hope, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't know quite what to say about that. It's such a, I mean, I know the plant's gonna get really big. So I, ha I have a few people in my life that know about the project and, are, are, and, and one of them is actually, a, are they called a horticulturalist? Is that what they're called? I believe so. Um, I, I've had a number of people tell me the plant's gonna become massive and it really has already, it, you know, not quite doubled in, in, in height, but it's grown a lot. I'm, I don't know what I'm gonna do when it's a lot bigger than me. I think yeah. the paintings will have to change a lot then maybe. Awesome, thank you. Um, I think that's all the questions that I had.